Okay. Now you should be able to see that. Looks good. You should be able to yes. see a Rhino model. I apologize for that. I'm new, <laughs> new to this. Too many high tech stuff, and there are too many screens on this uh, on this uh, dialog box. So uh, please bear with me. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to start with a very generic shape, a, a, a group of uh, polylines that represent this contour here. First thing that I do is that uh, to get rid of the extras, I go into uh, Edit, Select Objects, and Curves. These are all curves. I hide them all, and what's left is everything that I don't like. So I do Control A, select everything, and delete, and unhide everything to bring back what is of interest to me at this time. So then um, I select my objects, and it says all properties. These are 331 curves. <clears throat> and um, the display color, it says, is varies. So I'm going to go and say display this by layer. And then, of course, uh, I, then I have to go and ch change the color of the layer. Here I can see layer 0, which is this one. I set it to lavender. And so here I have all my curves colored as lavender. OK, very well. One of the functions that have, I'm going to, you, you see the entirety of my screen, but here on this computer here, I need to move that a little bit around. So I'm going to make my screen a bit smaller so I can see it on my monitor here, on my projector. One moment, please. Okay. All right. Let me shrink it in this direction a little bit. Okay. And a little bit in this direction. That should be fine. One more. Okay. Very good. All right. You should be able to see on the screen, maybe I need to shrink it a little bit more so I can see my dialog boxes here. Okay. All right. <clears throat> these, um, these curves, one of the easiest way to create a surface from these curves um, is now the use of this uh, function called mesh patch. Basically, what this will do is that it will take points from these curves and create a Delaunay triangulation. So the most sort of natural way of triangulating this pit. It would not be very uh, intuitive uh, because you won't see the benches very clearly, but it's a way to just connect all the points together to make triangles. And this operation, if you did that right away and ran it by clicking on this mesh patch, you'll find that it's relatively time consuming, although much faster than it used to be. One of the first operations that I will do is that I will create some points on this curve. So first, I, I want to get an idea of how big these distances are. So I go to Analyze distance and I find out that say from this point to this point there's 28 meters if my model is in meters. So I decide that I'm going to select all these points and I go to curve point objects divide curve by length of segments and I say it, it talks to you about seams I return and I say and it says that the lengths range from 3 millimeter all the way to <clears throat> 5 kilometers so I'm going to use a, a, a typical uh, length of 5. So I say break down all these curves into curves of length 5 and give me the points that results from that. So when I do that I get all these points here and it's these points that I'm going to use to create my Delaunay uh, triangulation. Okay, And in doing so you can experiment by using a denser distribution or a coarser distribution you get different things. At this time I go to edit, <coughs> select objects and I select my points. These are these points, and I say I ask the program to generate for me a mesh patch. And mesh patch means create a Delaunay triangulation of this object. Click on this, and uh, it asks me for a starting surface. Sometimes you can create a, a rectangular surface that is horizontal, and that will serve as a seed for the generation of this surface. Otherwise, I'm going to say just go ahead and do that. And that creates for me immediately on my screen a bunch of triangles although I still have a proliferation of points. And so I'm going to get rid of all these points which just were needed here to create the Delaunay triangulation. So I'm going to go say edit, edit, select objects, points, and usually make the whole, that makes the whole model much lighter. So delete these points and all I should have right now is my, um, my triangulation. And um, I'm going to select uh, everything else other than the triangulation. I, there are some curves in there. Edit, select objects, curves, and the curves will go away. And all I have now is a triangular representation. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and quickly go over uh, the creation of a complete model. So first uh, I'm going to look at the top view here and kind of devise a rectangle representing a computational domain. I go into uh, 
curve, rectangle, corner to corner, for instance, going, say, from here to here. Now that I'm done with this, um, now I look at it sideways, and I see, of course, that uh, my, um, you know, my uh, pit lips are, are much higher than that. Now I need to move this uh, uh, rectangle some, to some sort of a height. Uh, this is not planar, so what I will do is I select this rectangle, and I say transform, move, and I click on vertical, meaning saying that this point, I want this point to move vertically to say to, say, for example, to this point, which means that the whole curve will come sort of at the same level as the uh, outside of this pit. Next thing that I would like to do is uh, to extract the boundary of this pit. If I used a hidden surface, uh, you will see that um, um, I can now use this command here called uh, duplicate mesh hole boundary, but really duplicate border should do. If I just typed in here duplicate border, that would do exactly that. So it says select what is it that you want to extract the border from, and I say this one, and immediately this curve appears on the side. So if I hide the mesh, you'll be able to see that there's a border, and now there is my rectangle. Here what I'm trying to do is that I'm trying to extend this pit so that it reaches the, direct, the rectangle. One easy way to do that is to, um, there are a number of ways to do this. One, one of the ways that I can do this is I can say, look, take these two curves and do this meshing, as I said, Delaunay uh, triangulation. So if I click on that, it says uh, select holes, means the part that you don't want to mesh, and I say OK, and it will create this triangulation. This, as interesting as it looks like, it's a little bit problematic, especially for making uh, three-deck models, because it doesn't have enough points in here. And three-deck sometimes lacks to have some transition in terms of triangles as you get farther and farther away from details. And so giving it, giving it a mesh that is too coarse doesn't leave enough nodes for 3 deck to play around with. So it's nice, even though in 3 deck you want a mesh that is very coarse, it's good to give 3 deck as a triangular surface, a triangular surface that has a lot of triangles and a lot of points. So this would not be good because there are no points here for 3 deck to use in here. So I'm going to go back and not use this process I'm going to use a different method to create this surface. I'm going to actually create a surface by creating this curve, which is a closed curve. Uh, again, this is one of the features of Rhino 5, which it says that it's an object that is closed. And I'm going to select also the second curve. And now I use this command called lofting, which is a very easy way. It's going to say that I'm going to connect this side to this side. So let's see what it's going to do. And that created this very kind of twisty surface. I really don't like it. I go back, or I can say that I um, want a different kind of uh, lofting. Uh, I repeat the lofting operation, and I say maybe you want to move this point maybe a little bit more to a more uh, acceptable place here. And I say, OK, do that. This looks a little bit more uh, attractive. Um, uh, you see that some of these corners are missing. I need to go back and look at my lofting and make sure that uh, uh, it has used the right parameters. Again, loft here. And uh, it says that it's going to connect this one. So I'm going to move this point from here, say, to here. I say, OK. And uh, I think there's a window that is popping out that I'm not seeing on my screen. Uh, let's see, where is that? OK, but this, this is a bit better, I think. OK, this is basically the result of the lofting. So you have to be kind of careful. Sometimes if you want to make sure that uh, there are no creases formed on this surface, because if you do a little hidden surface like this, you can see these sort of creases that uh, form in sort of like the way you put a bed sheet and uh, causes creases, because it has, there's a parametrization of this curve and a parametrization of the rectangle, and they don't necessarily always correspond to each other. So you could maybe try to split this curve into four pieces, and you say, you know, I want this piece from here to here to connect to this segment, and the piece from here to here to connect to this segment, etc. So there's a much co better controlled way to do that. But at any rate, we obtain here the surface. And this surface uh, uh, is now, this is actually a surface, and so we need to go and mesh it. And to mesh it, I'm going to use the meshing uh, tool here. Uh, any of the, uh, uh, so I'm going to, the dialog box is a little bit outside of the screen, so I'll bring it up here. This dialog box says, this is the uh, polygon detailed option. There is a simple control that will give you something, but that one is a little bit uh, too simplistic, and it will not produce enough grids. What we are trying to do, we are trying to create a triangulation here that has enough grid points in here. We don't want triangles that go all the way across from one, one end to the other end. 
because as I said, to create uh, successful 3DEC models, for instance, it's nice to have a lot of points to work with. And then it's during the mesh generation process in Kubrix for 3DEC that, 3DEC that the mesh generator will remove the nodes that it doesn't need. So I'm going to go back to the detailed option. And in this detailed option, I have set that I want my maximum edge length, maximum edge length to be 100. In asking this, uh, you can ask for refined or doesn't refine and, and pack texture. We're not using that. So give me a preview. And the preview looks kind of like that. That to me looks fine. And I say okay and I accept this mesh. And while the surface is uh, uh, selected, I delete it. So here is a mesh of the surface. Of course, we still have the mesh of the pit in here. So these two will correspond with each other, hopefully. Uh, we'll match them together. And then, um, then we need to complete this model by going in there and uh, uh, maybe turning off all the meshes, hiding them, and then removing the surfaces, the, uh, the curves, and bring up everything. Okay, very good. Now I'm going to join these two meshes together. There are two meshes. I'm, I can join them, or I can just, while they're separate, uh, I can colorize them. These two now, in the latest version of Kubrick, you select your object and you click, click on the colorize function, and that colorizes the object into two different pieces, okay, two different colors. Now I can select both of these things at the same time and say match mesh edges and, uh, and use a certain number here and that will match, that will try to match the boundary between these two objects even though the objects have not been joined together. That's a nice functionality here. But I'm going to join all these things together as one single mesh and use the uh, uh, show edges dialog box here to see if there are any edges in here. And again, I'm moving my dialog box on the screen and I will see that here, I will see that zoom will indicate that there are some points that haven't been matched. So now I again um, select the object and do this match mesh edges, move my distance to adjust from say 0 0.001 to 0 0.01 and that should give me a better um, matching. Uh, clearly there are no more naked edges within the model, there are some outside, that's good enough for me, I stop very well. So now we're going to close this model now to, by, by extracting the boundary of this model. Again, again, we can use the duplicate border. If I type here duplicate border, that works for surfaces and meshes. And I select my object and here I get my border. Now I'm going to um, move this thing down, extrude it. And while this is selected, I go to surface, uh, extrude curve, uh, straight. And straight meaning like that. So I'm, and I'm going to type minus 1,000. And that should bring it down to minus 1,000 below. Hopefully, that's enough. Very well. So I get rid of my curve. And this is a surface. This is a mesh. So I need to mesh this surface. Again, I use that same tool. Again, I want to have enough grid points. Again, I use the complicated or the, or the detailed option to produce a mesh of the boundary on the side, uh, which I hope it did. Control Z. OK, so select my surface. Um, and then I go to mesh and 100 preview. I guess I can't really see very well what's happening, but I hope I trust that it meshed it. Yeah, it's not perfect. Um, I, I don't understand why it doesn't produce a closer mesh. Maybe it's because it's an extrusion. So um, I, I, I guess I don't understand what's going on. But at any rate, let me just go ahead and connect these two together. Join, and that will give me one mesh. And these two meshes should perfectly match. If I go in here and use my, um, my edge uh, tool here, uh, all the naked edges are outside where they're supposed to be. Fine. So um, now at this time, this is a mesh that is almost closed. To close it completely, I go and use this tool here, which is called Fill Mesh Hole. I left click on this thing and click on the edge here, and that basically closes this object. Again, that's not very nice because it produces very large meshes. I say, actually, I'm going to go back and extract this boundary. So at this time, I'm going to use this duplicate mesh hole. This is a specific boundary tool for meshes that I'm going to use here. And now I say, this, surf, this curve now create a surface that sits on it. So instead of creating a mesh directly by closing this, which would result in very large zones or triangles, I am asking it to create a surface. And then I'm going to mesh the surface in a controlled way. So surface, uh, and I say uh, uh, planar curves. And this creates a planar uh, curve for this. 
And now this surface, I'm going to mesh it again with my command here, which hopefully produces no grid more than 100. And I say, OK, and it produces that kind of a grid. And I get rid of the surface. And now I need to match these two things together. I join them, and I use these match mesh edges. And, and that should give me, and as soon as the color kind of flips like that, it's a sign that all the matching has been done. We need to just uh, make sure that the orientation is proper. So we select our object. And I click on this tool, which is Unify Mesh Normals, and I get the, a nice uh, mesh that is supposedly closed. Uh, there shouldn't be any free edges in here. And I, when I read this thing, it says uh, no naked edges, no non-manifold edges. So at this time, maybe it's a good idea to go in here and select this model and uh, do a little check on the quality of this mesh. Uh, again, in Rhino 5, the check grid, check mesh has disappeared, and just the plain check thing works well. And it gives you some additional information about uh, 17 faces where the normals, these are, these are triangles that are very, very, um, um, that don't follow necessarily, they're kind of oriented uh, funny. Uh, there may be a, a very quick uh, change in normals as you go from an um, edge to another edge, and that's, why, that's what it's complaining about. But for now, we, we, we will go ahead and try this. So this is a model that we have created. We haven't really done any kind of simplification in here. But when I select my model and export this, export selected, um, and I'm going to export that as an STL file. So I go in here and say STL, and STL here. And I will call it, uh, this is my webinar, call it t5.stl. And I save it. So you, don't, you didn't see the saving uh, window, which was in a separate place. And now I'm going to go and ahead and uh, launch Kubrix. Here, the dialog box starts. And I run Kubrix. The dialog box says to me that here, that my working directory is not correct. Meaning that since I ran Rhino from the start menu, it thinks that I'm currently in a uh, directory, which is the Rhino directory, which is in the C directory. So you have added this warning because Rhino 5 is a little more strict about where its working directory is. So that means that I'm going to use the command set working directory. And now a dialog box comes up that says that I am working in the class Minneapolis webinar. That's my working directory. Now when I click on Kubrix, then I have a dialog box that comes on the screen right here. And I have the uh, console that appears also on the screen, which I'm also bringing in here. And here I click input file, the name of the input file will be a.stl, uh, t5.stl, which I brought in. And I click on default once, and I say compute. And at this point, I should get some error messages about the quality of the surface if there are problems. And this should happen pretty quickly, because I ran it this morning. And so there are no problems in the mesh. But after the surface had been remeshed, as you can see in here, we started with uh, a number of triangles in the other, in 86,000 triangles. When it has been remeshed for the purpose of 3 deck, now it has only 14,000 triangles. And from these new 14,000 triangles, which are more economical and fewer than what you see here, then it starts to grow tetrahedra that will fill everything else. But in doing so, in coarsening the mesh, it found some self-intersecting points. So I'm going to select these self-intersecting points from here, or you can select it from the Kubrix log file. I'm going to select this from this dialog box, and then now I have in my buffer here, XYZ, 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 three XYZ points, which I, uh, excuse me, uh, going back to my dialog box here. Okay, all right. Uh, so now I'm going and select um, curve polyline. I say, I'm, I want to draw a polyline, and I want the points of this polyline is what I've copied. I'm going to paste those three lines into this by doing control V, and it drew for me a, a line here that basically points to a particular area. This is somehow a trick that we, we use here to interactively clean up our Rhino model while uh, with using Kubrick's outputs. So I'm interested in finding out what is going on in here. So I'm going to hide everything but this one that is highlighted, zoom in close by, get closer, and bring back again my object. And it points out to something around here. For some purpose, for some reason, there may be a very skinny triangle in here, or it, there's something, nothing really wrong, but once it has been remeshed, due to the waviness of this area, the, 
two uh, overlapping triangles are formed. This is very common with 3D especially. And you can get rid of these things by reducing the cut angle in the Kubrick's dialog box, or you can just clean up the surface. And so we don't want to reduce the cut angle in the Kubrick's dialog box because then Kubrick's will pick up all the other noise that is in our model. Here, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to get rid of this, uh, of this artifact. So I'm going to use this command here called, um, uh, which is called here, align mesh vertices. I click on this and it says select vertices and I select a vertex here. Oops, sorry. So I select a vertex here and that means the vertex over which all the other vertex will collapse. Now I'm going to select the other vertices that I would like to collapse on top of it, all these three, and return. And it says distance to adjust. I'm going to set a very large number. Um, I don't, and this whole thing will collapse. And this is my curve that I used as a wand here to indicate this point. I delete that. Now this surface, I, and you know, this looks a little bit uh, suspicious as well, this point here. So I'm going to use that same command again here, the uh, align mesh vertices. Again, I select this vertex. I click on this point and then I also select this point and I say make sure that you don't grab a point that is behind the object. But this is done. Now, I, now that I've done this, it's always a good idea to select this object and say um, check. And as I check this thing, it says there are no particular problems. And I export this now as my output file. Export selected as uh, uh, I call it uh, t5.stl. You don't see that on your screen, but maybe you do. I say OK, and that is, I have a new t5.stl. Now what I will do is that I go ahead and now run this. Uh, this time, uh, Kubrick's will run. I bring up the dialog box on the screen here, and I also bring the, uh, the uh, console here so you can see it. And then I go in here, same parameter, everything remains the same, compute. So if I haven't goofed off here, my input surface should be fine. Uh, no intersection during the reading of the geometry. Actually, the surface has been remeshed. Now it has checked for surface F intersection, and there was no problems. But there may still be problems in generating blocks. And it will indicate to me, again, to some anomalies. And this message that appears in here every now and then is an indication that it is trying various things to, to fit this tetrahedra in there. Uh, sometimes at the end of that, it still produces a mesh. Sometimes it indicates a point where there's a problem. And it seems like it has completed the mesh generation process. And we see here that, oh, we produced, you know, these 14,000 triangles on the outside produced 96,000 tetrahedral elements. This is kind of, it kind of makes sense. You know, 14,000 is kind of like 10,000. And 10,000 is like uh, uh, 100 times 100. And the number of blocks would be 100 times 100. It's L3. So it would be a million. So the orders of magnitudes are like that. Uh, 14,000, you know, 100,000 here. 100,000 blocks is too much for this particular thing. We would like to do uh, coarser than that. And also, it gives you an indication of where are the, if there are any bad blocks, is that the worst blocks range from 10 to the minus 5 to the minus 4. It's not necessarily very bad news, but you know, uh, this is a pretty uh, strained model. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to show you one step here of how to clean up the surface. Um, one solution here is to go back to my geometry and uh, uh, extract the surface here. So I'm going to separate uh, this part of the mesh from the top. And the operation consists in going using these connected faces. Connected faces means that I can click on here all these faces that are connected with this with, a, with an angle. I'm going to bring up the dialog box so you can see what this, how this works with an angle of one degree. So, you know, if I reduce from one to zero, that works, you know. Uh, if, I, if I increase that to 90 degree, this patch will jump over the rest of the model very quickly. If I typed here 90, or the whole model will be infected. But I'm going to type just one here. That allows me to just select this wall. I say edit selection, then I click on this one, I select this one, edit selection, uh, this one, edit selection, and this last one here, and at the bottom here as well, edit selection and click on the bottom. And I say now, OK, I have essentially separated the boundary of this model from the rest of it. So this is one thing, and the top is another thing. In fact, I can even colorize the two separately as two different entities, uh, which is kind of another very fortunate color here. Purple here, and, and 
So I'm going to hide this thing or delete that for now. And this surface here, maybe I'll change the color. This is not very pretty. So here, let's see, let's make it a bit lighter, like cyan. Okay, very good. This is my triangulation. There are a number of ways that we have that we can make this much a bit more palatable. First of all, you want to get rid of these um, details in there. You know, if I use a given, so we can see that, okay, these are all very pretty, but do we really want to capture them? Especially considering that there are some artifacts that we've introduced here due to simply creating this lofted surface. These are really unreal. Maybe these may be real. These are okay, but we don't want that much detail. How do we get rid of this detail? One good solution for this is to select this object and transform it. In the transformation menu, we will see a operation called smooth. And this smooth operation has a dialog box, which I will drag onto the screen so you can see it. It basically has a new function called fix boundaries. So the boundaries will be fixed. So as the object is going to be relaxed and smooth, the boundaries will remain the same. And I say, go ahead and smooth this by a factor, say, one. And I say, OK. And if you look close by, you see what happened. Control Z prior to this smoothing. Control Y one more time. It's basically, it goes and every single point is averaged between the points it was attached to. So this point is averaged with this node, this node, and this node. And again, this point is averaged between this node, this node, this node, and this node. So as you do that more and more, the object becomes kind of more and more uh, uh, smudgy and, and, and smoothed out. So let's just do this just once here. Now, it does also produce some weird artifacts on the surface, which can be problematic. But overall, it contributes to reducing the model, si the model uh, complexity. So I'm going to go ahead and do one more time, one more uh, block of smoothing here. So I say again, smooth. And again, I say go ahead and do one more time. It smoothed it one more time. You can do maybe another time. It, you, know, you can do a few times here. And make, OK, good. That's not my new surface. Now, this surface, I'm going to go and extract the boundary and mesh that exactly as I did before. Or I could actually go back and grab what I had before, which is uh, I do Control Z back to where I was before. That's when I had this part. I copy it and bring it with me to the future by going Control Y, Control Y, Control Y, Control Y, Control Y, Control Y. Y to here and paste it right here. Now I join the two together. Now I have a newer mesh that I don't have to build the outside for and join that together into one single mesh. Verify quickly. This has no free edges. It says no free edges, no non-manifold. Good. Uh, uh, and it has to be uh, joined together, of course. I have to join these two. Uh, I think that's the way it is, right? OK, so it's good. All right. So this model, now I do a check to see if there are any particular problems with this. Yeah, it says certain things, but uh, not too preoccupying. So I just go ahead and I say, OK, save this as a.stl. File, export selected. And I, uh, dialog box should come in. Uh, I'm sorry, t5.stl. I save that. I overwrite the previous t5.stl. And I get now this new model. So I, again, go ahead and run Kubricks. This time, uh, I'm going to bring back, again, the dialog box on the screen. Same parameters. Everything remains the same. Uh, we can expect some problems because there may be some folding that occurred in the model. Compute, uh, as I compute here, read this, the geometry, the number of triangles hasn't changed. We just have average grid points. So the topology of the model hasn't changed. The geometry of the model has. It, it found some little intersection on the surface. So we're going to go and clear this up real quickly. Whoops. Uh, so we go right away to the dialog box in here that we had. I go to Kubrick's log which I will bring up on the screen here. I can pick this up from cubic slot. So it says that the surface that we read after the smoothing process produced some self-intersection. So I'm going to copy this thing and create a polyline on the screen, polyline here, and paste these things on it. So it says in these particular areas, we have some problems. OK, um, I'm going to explode this curve so I have the multiple curves. And, uh, I, and hide everything but the curve so that I can freely zoom in perfectly well to the tip of this end here, right here. In fact, I can just use this so we have a very, very close-up view of our model. And then I click out in here. So what is going on here? Yeah, there's some funny business going on in here. And so what I'm going to do, again, I'm going to use that tool that I find very useful. And that tool essentially consists in using here this Align Mesh Vertices. Click on this, select the vertex, in this case here. So this is, for example, the vertex over which everything else I want to collapse. And then I go ahead and 
select all these other stuff. I want to collect it. But there are some other, these are all the um, grid points that are behind it, which I don't want. So I hold down the control button and select these things, making sure that these are not selected. So now I have all my points, and I say enter, and the adjustment is one, and so everything will be collapsed like that. This is more or less OK. Uh, this, this, some, uh, this is a little bit uh, preoccupying here. So I can maybe flip this thing. And there's this tool here called, um, there's a flipping tool in here. I don't see the whole mesh, the whole model. Uh, swap mesh edges here. So and I go and I swap this thing because I really don't like this quick jump. OK, you see, it, I swapped it. So now I obtain something that looks a bit more civilized here. So it's good. So I remove this curve that I had in here that is pointing out to problem areas. And there's another curve here. I remove that one, and I remove that one. They were all pointing to the same general area. There, some, uh, there were some folding in here. So now I look back at the rest of my model again, and I say edit select objects, curves. And now I see that uh, there's a remaining problem area. Zoom in close by. Zoom here, close by. Uh, unhide. And again, I see that there's a little problem area. And sure enough, there's some, uh, looks like there's been an earthquake. And so what I will do here uh, is that it's the smoothing or the very kind of an aggressive smoothing that we use that kind of cause this kind of problem. Uh, I'm going to use again that same tool uh, here, this, uh, select this vertex. And you would wonder how I'm going to deal with that I'm exactly the same way that I dealt with the other one. And I say just go ahead and all these points, just, just bring them over, collapse them on top of each other, making sure that we don't grab these points because we don't want to grab points behind. And let's see what happens in here. More or less OK. I'll do that again. This point, select vertices. And then I'm going to say this vertex. And I want um, this vertex and this vertex and this vertex and, and these vertices to be. It's a little bit risky. Maybe there would have been a better way to do this thing. But so I've created somehow something more or less acceptable. Maybe I'm getting myself in trouble here. But at any rate. In this way, I will clean up this model. And as, as you can see, um, all the details on this model have been smoothed out pretty much. And now, usually, if that I were to complete this thing, you know, apart from the little um, aggressive smoothing that I did, which caused those kind of funny areas, I would end up with a model that, instead of um, uh, 97,000 blocks, might end up with 1,500, 1, 2,000 blocks. That's uh, I'm not going to go into more detail because I want to keep the number of, uh, I want to keep this, uh, the length of this presentation as short as possible. But basically, the smoothing here was one way of doing that. There's another way to do this that I would like to also talk about before we uh, uh, go beyond our, our, which we have already encroached on our time here. Uh, I'm going to go in here and go back to the previous model. So Control Z, back to before we did the smoothing. So I'm going back here to prior the smoothing process before we have this thing. And one solution that we have here is to select this model prior to even decomposing it. So we have one single triangular surface. There's a tool that is available that was not working before in Rhino. And it was this tool called Reduce Mesh Polygon Count. I click on this thing. A dialog box comes in, which I'm going to drag onto the screen here, and it says, Reduce the number of blocks, the number of triangles, or number of polygons. And I can say, yeah, go ahead and reduce by 50%. Uh, there's a choice here for accuracy and so on. You can look at the help, at the contextual help that shows you how this function works. But at any rate, if I say preview, it goes through a quick uh, calculation. And uh, this is a pretty large model, so it takes a little bit of time. But it will uh, offer you a new triangulation surface, which is way coarser. Now, this is something that is attractive for making models that are, have millions of triangles, usually coming from a GIS data, more palatable. But I don't recommend it too much for, again, for 3 deck models. You want to have a 3 deck model, a triangulation that has enough grid points for your 3 deck model. But sometimes this is acceptable. So here you go from a model. Uh, so if I do Control Z, you get the model prior to this operation. And Control Y, you get the model now after this operation. As you can see, it has removed triangles from certain areas that it deemed flat. And in other areas where there is uh, some curvature, it does not remove triangles. It, it's, it's an intelligent um, triangle sort of removal tool. Um, another thing that I could do, I could 
be very aggressive, select this object and reduce the number of triangles by as much as 90% or 95% even and see what we get. Um, and sometimes it reacts by saying that, you know, I cannot make it finer. Um, oh, this time I forgot to grab the whole model. I just grabbed the top. So it's going to refine the top uh, or coarsen the top instead of uh, coarsening the complete mesh at once. So here you can see that it has really created a way coarser mesh. Again, coarser doesn't necessarily mean that has noise has been removed, but at least a bunch of extra triangles are gone. So this is another tool that is available to you. And then finally, and that's sort of uh, my last uh, uh, sort of tool that is available, is the good old draping tool. And the draping tool in the top view, I will bring it up here on the screen, the draping tool allows me to say, recreate this surface by putting a, say, silk tablecloth on top of this object. So an, a surface that is a, has a very kind of a smooth uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, stiffness to it. And so I can, I'm going to draw a picture here. I'm going to draw a square here, rectangle here that goes from here to here and let go. And now as I look at the surface in perspective, again, I will, um, I can maybe select them both. I can select them both and colorize them so that we can separate them. And then if I go in here and um, I use this hidden surface thing here and I can turn off one of them. This is my original mesh that I turn off. And now this is this new mesh. You can see there is an inherent smoothing that we are using here. That's very nice, okay? And if you want to use that, this is, remember that this is a surface. If you're going to mesh this, you're going to select it and use the meshing tool that will mesh this for you like this. And I will throw away the surface. This is the meshed version of that, uh, uh, which creates sort of these artifacts in there. There's also a really nice way to use this, a bit different than meshing. You go into mesh and say, from nerves control polygon. So each of these little squares on, the, on these nerves, uh, on this CAD definition, will become a mesh. So I say from nerves control polygon, and I click on this, and here now, if I say, uh, so if I click in here, you see that there's a, both a mesh and a surface in here. Uh, I'm going to select the mesh, and this mesh now looks like this. Yes, so this is actually a mesh that is made out of the little squares that were in the, in the uh, triangles. And again, if I use this in my 3 deck model, I will produce a model that has way fewer blocks. And let's go for it and finish everything um, a little bit here. So duplicate border and give me the uh, boundaries object. Now I'm going to extrude that down. Um, surface uh, extrude curve straight and I say minus 1000 and it goes down in here. This surface I'm going to mesh it uh, again using that same methodology that I used before. I'm using density of 1 here. Uh, okay. Uh, and delete now the surface. We have two meshes. One here and here, we join them together and we match them together. We check to see if there are any free edges in here. There are some free edges on the boundary. I need to join it together, so I use these match mesh edges with a distance to adjust of, say, for example, one. And uh, Okay, so select my object, uh, match mesh edges, and do it. And so now I check for the naked edges. There are no more on top. They are in, all in the bottom. I select the boundary in the bottom. Uh, I use, uh, again, uh, uh, I select my object and I say duplicate border and that will give me this curve and I say planar curve. I create a surface from that curve. Uh, sorry, this is my curve and planar curve. Oh, my curve is not planar. Very well. Not a problem. I just go ahead and close that normally with the uh, using this closing tool. Okay, so this is live demo. So there's always okay. So I created this thing and I select my old model and I say make sure that all the normals are unified. Okay, I'm not terribly happy here with the triangulation that are very coarse in here, but let's leave with this for now. I select this object, check for quality. It tells me that there are four pairs of faces that intersect. This is a new command. New uh, sort of return from this uh, model. Uh, you know, I invite you to look at what this means. Um, I don't totally 
fully understand. There's some tests that are involved with there. But you can see that there's much less information. That means that it's, it's a much better quality. It's a less problematic geometry. So I select this thing and I export it as an STL file. Export selected as an STL. And it should come up. I call it again t5.stl as I did before. And now I go ahead. Uh, I close this dialog box here. And I go ahead and I launch Kubrix. The Kubrix dialog box appears on my right screen, which I bring over on this here, uh, here, and I say uh, compute. The names all remain the same. Compute. And you can see here, suddenly, that we went from a 90,000 tetrahedral block for a 3 deck model to an 800 tetrahedral block. And that is uh, remarkable. Uh, if, I, if I read in the WRL file that was generated as a result of this thing, you can, I can over, you can see that the 3 deck model is extremely coarse and maybe nice or maybe overly coarse for this problem, but we have managed to create a very coarse model here, which is what we want. All right, um, my presentation is over. If you have any questions, I think all the, all the uh, microphones are on, uh, so please feel free to... Uh, uh, to uh, ask any questions if you have. There are right now, how many are we? We're about 11, 12, 13, 11, 11 people here. So please go ahead and if you have any questions, I'm at your disposal here to answer questions. If you have... Razor. Yes. Uh, John here. Yeah, hi, John. Um, uh, how are you? Uh, look, I, um, I bring in DXF files to uh, Rhino, and they're generally, uh, I guess, representative of a, a solid volume. Yes. And ve very, very complex in shape. Yes. And I, I, I really struggle to try and, uh, I guess, form surfaces to represent that so that I can then mesh it in a flat 3D uh, environment. Have you any tips or tricks? Yeah, so if, if uh, yeah, I, you know, you know, it's not a very easy thing, but usually once you find a recipe, it works out for, you know, for a number of, you know, you, you, can, you can reuse it. So, first of all, if these geometries are very, um, you know, organic in nature, such as faults and topographies and things of that sort, uh, if they are very, very, uh, if they're heavy in terms of number of triangles, but not too many self-intersections, Tools like what I showed here in terms of reducing the number of triangles with that reduced mesh uh, um, uh, relaxation uh, using that uh, transformation and smoothing process or draping usually takes care of those things. But if the surfaces are like stopes or, or, or faults that are very, very close to each other and often inter self-intersect and so on, often you have to reconstruct these models in the sense that you take all these, you know, DXF file that look like a big ball of hair, and you use the command in Rhino called contour, and you slice them into a lot of sort of parallel contours, and in there you go and you redraw the contour curves by making polylines and create simpler surfaces that then you loft into surfaces that, you know, match your original surface. So there's always, okay. we are always doctoring up the surfaces. Yeah, because uh, the I guess the shapes I'm trying to talk about are things like um, uh, blobs of granite or porphyry, and uh, they kind of just sit themselves in 3D space. Yes. And trying to form surfaces that can make that shape is really quite difficult. I have actually found that um, a program that uh, Rhino uh, Resurf, uh, which you can change the DXF into a point cloud and then. Uh, apply some parameters to try and make surfaces for them, but uh, it gets quite, um, I guess, tricky uh, because yeah. you can drape things on it and form surfaces, but you need to try and cut them all to form the volume. Right. right. No, I, I, I hear you. And, and uh, one, one point that I didn't really uh, brought up here, and we use that uh, often also, if we have a surface, a, 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 a very bad quality triangulated surface, but it has to be really like a surface. It shouldn't have any thickness to it. Or even if, even if it has a thickness and you want to approximate it as a surface, you just extract all its points and you say re-triangulate these points. That's what you're, uh, that's what you're saying. 
and um, yes. that uh, that works well if the surface has a certain characteristic to it. If it's like a big ball of wax, then it becomes t totally intractable. And in that case, I would say um, my my preferred approach is to um, uh, essentially um, try to uh, um, uh, you know remake that shape, meaning that you take a few. You say that this blob is essentially kind of like a sphere, and you draw one, two, three, four, five, six, twelve different edges on this sphere, and build a new cube, sort of on this, a, a, some, something right. that has the topology of a cube. You know, you, you basically retrace this thing by hand, and, and often uh, that is a good solution for that kind of thing. But if you have examples of, of intractable problems like that, please uh, don't hesitate to email them to me. At least I can have a quick look and get back to you with some um, uh, recommendations. But you know, often yeah, my yeah. colleagues, most, I, I learned you know, my colleagues who, who accumulated a lot more experience on that than I have. And so, um, so uh, please feel free to send me an example and I'll be glad to look at it. Yeah, that'd be great, Reza. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions here? Uh, so, will you upload this uh, video online on the website or not? I'm sorry, I, what, what, is your, uh, what is your affiliation? What is your name? I'm sorry? Uh, my name is Tagi. Actually, my question is this. Will you upload, upload this video on the Artasco website or not? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm actually saving this right now. And after uh, the end of the, the, of the webinar, I'm going to uh, copy. Uh, we're going to hopefully place one of these things on the Itasco website. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, otherwise, you know, I'm I'm available. You can email me, uh, and I'm here to help. Um, uh, um, you know, if it's a quick question, I'd be glad to answer. At least I can direct you in a direction, <laughs> in a, in a good direction. But uh, please don't hesitate to email me. I'm uh, tagavi at itaskacg.com. That's t a g h a b i at itaskacg.com. So please don't hesitate to to ask uh, questions. Uh, this 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 area of cleaning up geometries, it's you know it's any software whether you use you know uh, Itasca software, you use Abacus, Ansys, Dyna, Pat, you know uh, Abacus Explicit, uh, whatever. It's the same issue. It cannot be automated very easily. And those who automate it, for example, Octree, sort of will automate this kind of stuff. But then you lose uh, some um, you lose some uh, definition and then um, you know hopefully at my next uh, meeting um, uh, I'll, I'll be able to talk to you about the uh, great uh, mesh generator that we have developed it's a it's a essentially a mapped meshing tool a visual uh, interactive meshing that uses the flag 3d commands except visually very fast and very easy and works as a rhino plugin which should be available should be online in a few months we, we are right now testing it at in-house and that would be good for a lot of, say, civil engineering, tunneling problems, which are completely the opposite of these problems, where the geometries are very accidented and, and organic. But uh, uh, at this time, I would like to conclude this presentation. And I would be glad to respond to your questions uh, if you can uh, forward me your emails. OK? Thanks, thank Reza. Yeah, thank you, and um, see you next time. Hopefully, in three months, it'll be another uh, uh, webinar. Thanks, and uh, thank have a good uh, morning or uh, evening. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. bye.